So I'm just going to give a general overview of some of the more commonly prescribed benzodiazepines and a few clinical pearls, what makes each of these medications unique. There will be separate videos on each of these medications. We can categorize the benzodiazepines like the barbiturates, long-acting, medium-acting, short-acting, and ultra-short-acting according to their half-lives, the amount of time it takes the body to clear 50% of the drug. It's usually the liver doing the heavy lifting, and it takes five half-lifes to clear the medication entirely. The half-life also dictates how frequently a medication has to be dosed, although often patients require more frequent dosing than the half-life might lead you to believe. The long-acting agents that I'm going to review are Librium, the prototype, Valium, and Clonopin. These are the ones that are most commonly prescribed. Librium the first benzodiazepine that was discovered. It developed by accident with an elimination half-life of 24 to 48 hours. It's approved by the FDA for anxiety disorders and symptoms of anxiety, including preoperative apprehension, quote unquote. Although nowadays, midazolam versed is the preferred agent. It can be given IV and it's used to induce preoperative anterograde amnesia to assist in anesthesiology. You want the patients not only to be relaxed, they may be very nervous as you're wheeling them back to the operating room, but you also maybe don't want them to necessarily remember everything that goes on, especially in the OR as they're being moved to the table and getting set up before they go under. It's just not necessarily pleasant memories. And so it's good to induce a little bit. And Versed has a lot of amnesia with it. So it's favored. It's also approved to treat the withdrawal symptoms of acute alcoholism. And Librium, because it's the sort of the classic agent for that, appears to be the go-to agent even today. Although again, any benzodiazepine would work. It's really GABA that's coming to the rescue. And I saw that patient who would have probably died from status epilepticus due to DTs. He was treated very successfully with six milligrams of IV Ativan, so. Valium has a half-life of 24 to 48 hours. So it takes several days to clear it. It's FDA approved for the treatment of anxiety disorders symptoms of anxiety as well, this time with the caveat of short term only. And that's because the studies that were done that were shown to the FDA by the manufacturer, they only had short term data or the long term data maybe was mixed or there was some concern. They couldn't prove that it was safe and effective in the long term. Who knows? But there's a little caveat for Valium, but not for Librium. But again, that doesn't mean that in reality, that Valium is only good for the short-term treatment of symptoms of anxiety and not long-term like Librium. No, you can't make that assumption. That's just what the FDA has sanctioned. We use these medications off-label for a lot of things. And if you know, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what they're FDA approved for just for the sake of being complete, but these are not, they shouldn't guide your clinical decisions, certainly. Clinical decision-making always has to be guided by what is going on with the patient. Uh, Valium is also approved for the treatment of acute alcohol withdrawal symptoms specifically, and these are listed symptoms of acute agitation, tremor, and impending or acute delirium tremens, including hallucinosis, which is a feature of alcohol withdrawal delirium. Valium is approved for the treatment of skeletal muscle spasms due to reflex spasm, to local pathology. It's a favorite among clinicians to treat muscle spasms. Again, these medications, they all tend to work the same way, but clinicians tend to develop certain prescribing habits. Any benzodiazepine would work. Valium is also approved to be used for the treatment of spasticity caused by upper motor neuron disorder. 
that's a specific disorder in neurology and it's been shown to be effective in that because it was studied in that again proven to the FDA and it's also approved for atherosclerosis which is a specific kind of movement that's abnormal and stiff man syndrome and then it has a bunch of other specialized official indications for the injectable and the intravenous forms, esoteric conditions that I don't need to go into. The interesting thing about Valium is that it's more lipophilic than some of the other benzodiazepines, which means it crosses the blood-brain barrier more easily and more rapidly for a quicker onset of action. And so it feels different and some patients seem to respond favorably to that. Some patients seem to prefer Valium, possibly for that reason. And here's something special. Diazepam is the only benzodiazepine with a formulation specifically designed to be administered rectally. Yes, folks, diazepam suppositories are available. It's actually a rectal gel administered via syringe, and it's called Diastat because the onset of action is much quicker with absorption directly through the rectal mucosa, bypassing the stomach and any food that you might have. It's also one of the few benzodiazepines that are available in an oral liquid formulation and in an injectable formulation. They're not all available in injectable formulations. So. And finally, clonopin with an elimination half-life of approximately 30 to 40 hours approved by the FDA for panic disorder with or without agoraphobia and a group of esoteric seizure disorders. Ativan is a medium acting agent with an elimination half-life of 10 to 20 hours and no active metabolites. Because of its short half-life and inactive metabolites, lorazepam ativan is often preferred in some patients with liver disease. And lorazepam may be preferred over other benzodiazepines for the treatment of delirium as well. Ativan is also, by the way, available as an injectable and we would combine it with Haldol. We would give Haldol and ativan and cogentin to prevent acute dystonic reactions all in one syringe when in, in hospital settings for acutely manic or acutely psychotic or agitated patients when we had to settle them down we would give them Haldol and Ativan and cogentin in one shot. The FDA has approved the tablet and the oral liquid formulation for anxiety disorders and anxiety associated with depressive symptoms specific but anyway and the injection is approved for the initial treatment of status epilepticus to stop the seizures and also as a pre-anesthetic for anxiety in the OR or on the way to the OR. And though it hasn't been systematically studied Benzodiazepines and lorazepam in particular, just historically, have been used very effectively to treat catatonia, that psychotic symptom that I was talking about seen in schizophrenia. We used to have a catatonic type of schizophrenia. We don't categorize it like that anymore, but there used to be a catatonic type. But it is the initial recommended treatment, and I highly recommend that you guys check out that video. The two short acting agents, that I'm going to talk about include Xanax with an elimination half-life of 12 to 15 hours. And despite this, though, this is something that I have heard from patients time and time again, that when they take Xanax for sleep, if the dose is sufficient, they have morning grogginess. It carries over and they have a real hard time, even though it has a short half-life. And using Ativan or Clonopin, which have significantly longer half-lives, I don't hear that as much. So the two things that are important when you're looking at morning hangover would be not just the half-life, but the dose that you have to give. The dose that you have to give is almost more important. And so my guess is that small doses of Xanax don't get people up to sleep and they end up on higher doses and then that dose carries over despite the short half-life. Even though you're comparing it to Ativan and Clonopin, which have longer half-lives, but maybe which are more sedating. Now, don't quote me on that. That's just, I'm speculating on that. I just know that Xanax is favored usually in very low doses. It's a high potency agent for anxiety, and we don't use it a whole lot as a hypnotic as opposed to the other two. But regardless, 
Whatever the case is, there's a lot of morning grogginess, a lot of complaints of that with Xanax. The immediate release form is approved for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. There is an, a Xanax XR, which is I thought was kind of interesting. They chose to take one of the benzodiazepines with one of the shortest half-lives that typically has to be dosed two or three times a day if you're taking it during the day, and they chose to put that in an extended release preparation. But anyway, the XR preparation is only approved for the treatment of panic disorder. Again, I can guarantee you it would be effective for the treatment of generalized anxiety. It's just the FDA can't put its stamp of approval on there. We haven't proven that, but anecdotally you will find it time and again. You will find that to be true time and again. One of the most popular benzodiazepines for anxiety, it's very popular among primary care physicians and psychiatrists. Again, you know, we get into these ruts, we tend to choose Librium for alcohol withdrawal, we tend to choose Valium for muscle spasms, we tend to use Ativan for patients who are delirious or catatonic, and Xanax is the favorite for anxiety. But there's something about Xanax. I have another video called Everybody's Favorite. So check that out. Everybody loves Xanax. And I, and I won't say everybody loves Xanax. I'll say this. I've treated a lot of people with Xanax and then for whatever reason we switched to another agent, maybe because we need a longer half-life or whatever the case may be. And many, many, many times, I can't even count the number of times, patients will come back and they say they want to switch back to Xanax. Xanax, quote unquote, felt better. And so even though they're both equally effective at reducing anxiety, and I just think there's a sense of well-being that people get with Alprazolam that they don't get, certain people, maybe not all people. Benzodiazepines, for me, they just made me sleepy. I didn't understand where the party was. I always said, I want to be awake for my party. But I think it's just, it's just like alcoholism. I just don't have the genes that code for the proper machinery up here, the receptors and the hard wiring to make me feel that, ah, oh, that sense of well-being. And Xanax, I think for those individuals, is even more pronounced, that sense of well-being that they get. In fact, it's been studied as an antidepressant or as having antidepressant properties. I don't think that was replicated, but it stands apart from the other benzodiazepines in that if you're talking about feel-good benzos, Xanax is the king, supreme. Xanax XR might be less sedating than the immediate release preparation, which kind of makes intuitive sense. The Xanax XR preparation generally has a longer biological duration of action than clonopin. Clonopin we often think of as the long-acting Xanax, and a lot of times we will go from Xanax to clonopin when we need something that's going to be long acting, it's going to last all day so that a patient isn't having to excuse themselves to continue to take medication throughout the day for panic disorder, for example. But Xanax XR typically lasts even longer, so it can be considered an even longer acting clonopin. Halcyon. Halcyon has the fewest number of FDA-approved indications, exactly one, the short-term treatment of insomnia. And by short-term, we mean seven to 10 days, but it does have the best name. It's a very potent agent. It tends to cause a lot of amnesia and the half-life is ultra short, one and a half to five and a half hours. The shorter half-life, should prevent impairment in cognitive and motor performance during the day the next day, as well as daytime sedation in theory. But once you develop tolerance, the short half-life might result in increased anxiety during the day and or increased wakefulness during the latter part of the night, i.e. terminal insomnia. So it's not used very much, I don't think. I certainly haven't used it very much. And I don't know if the short-term caveat has placed a chilling effect on Halcyon, but it's just, it's not recommended for long-term use. As I said before, long-term treatment of insomnia with benzodiazepines is controversial. Anorograde amnesia may be more likely with triazolam. Again, it's notorious for that, which reminds me of Ambien and also hallucinations and unusual behaviors or agitation in certain vulnerable patient populations. 
So it, it stands apart, and whether that's due to its ultra-short half-life or whether that's due to some other aspect of its molecular structure, it, it has these distinct characteristics. When you stop it, rebound insomnia may be a particular problem. And again, that is, reminds me of Ambien, which also has this short action. And so the short duration of action, definitely those are more addictive and you do see more rebound anxiety during the day, like with Xanax, because they wear off so quickly. And so there is an association there, the craving, either physical or psychological for these medications does seem to vary inversely with their half-life. The shorter the half-life, the greater the potential for rebound and the potential for physical withdrawal. Like Ativan, Halcyon may be preferred in liver failure due to its pharmacokinetics. And finally, Transine, Chlorazepate. It's not a PAM, but it is actually a benzodiazepine, a prodrug which is rapidly metabolized to the long-lasting desmethyl diazepam. So this medication really is grouped with the long-acting agents. It has an elimination half-life of up to 50 hours, quite long, as long as clonopin. The mechanism of action is identical. It binds to a benzodiazepine receptor at the GABA-A ligand-gated chloride channel complex enhancing the inhibitory effects of GABA by boosting chloride conductance. And this happens because the chloride ion channel through which the anions are flowing, it's open more often. It increases the frequency of that opening. It's an all or nothing. It's not like it opens any wider, but it, it's open more often. And that increased opening frequency is what causes the hyperpolarization of that cell membrane, where the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside of the cell. And so it takes a lot, it takes a bigger stimulus to invoke an action potential, which relies on that reversing. Transine is approved by the FDA for anxiety disorders, symptoms of anxiety just in general, and acute alcohol withdrawal. Thank you for tuning in. Please look for individual videos on each of these medications, and comments are always welcome.